came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, by Ivan Van Sertima. Chapter 12 The Mystery of Mu Lan Pai. Far beyond the western sea of the Arabs' countries, Atlantic Ocean, lies the lands of Mu Lan Pai. The ships which sail there are the biggest of all. One ship carries a thousand men. On board are weaving looms and marketplaces. If it does not encounter favorable winds, it does not get back to port for years. Friedrich Hirth and W. W. Rockhill Chao Jukua His work on the Chinese and Arab trade in the 12th and 13th centuries At Sea Circa A.D. 900 The wind dropped to a calm and the sea became quite still we lay like swans asleep on a lake of blue glass. The Ruban, or captain, gave orders to let down all six of our stone angar, or anchors. And as we did so, I saw the large white shira, her sails, of our companion ship, large as a cloud, shrivel slowly down to the foot of the dakal, or mast. Thus we lay, staring into the emptiness of the sea and the sky for three days. On the fourth day, our angar were hoisted aboard. Half a hundred men went down into the karib, or lifeboats, and ropes were attached to the stern of the ship which stretched taunt over the water as the men rode and rode. They were like ants dragging a mountain. We made one night an hour. But it stirred us back to life, and we had only done it to kindle a spark from the smoke of our souls. This, above all, we who sailed in the great ships feared most, the calms even more than the fury and violence of al -Kab, the typhoon. Our ships were as large as ten houses, and we felt we were in a fortress, the walls of which were impregnable against the battering rams and catapults of the waves. It was the waiting that filled our hearts with terror, the windless silence the siege of space. We feared we would suffocate on the dry decks, drowned by the ocean of space itself, like fishes beached on the waterless sands, drowned in pure air. Allah be praised, the mercy of God on those who magnify Him for a gentle a favorable wind began to blow at last over the vast pool. Our great sails were unfurled, and once again we moved across the ocean-like clouds. There were about 800 men on board the two ships, and we magnified Allah and congratulated one another and wept from the intensity of our own happiness. Toward evening, birds came circling above us. They alighted on the lookout post at the top of the Dakal. But even as we rejoiced at the winds of the day and heard the song of the land and the shrieking banter of the birds, a shaft of lightning shone from the direction of the east. Thunder followed, and a rainstorm, and all the horizons were completely darkened. A powerful gale 
caught us and started to shake and beat upon our ship with a thousand hands. A great darkness fell upon us, a darkness so deep that for the rest of the night and far into the morning of the next day we could not see our companionship. The flashing of the waves, nor the still, far lamps of our heavenly pilots, the stars. Thus would an Arab African sailor, if he had kept a log, have written of some of his adventures on the high seas. It would be unlikely, however, that such a log would have survived the wholesale burning of Moorish documents in libraries in the squares of Grenada by Cardinal Jimenez in the late 15th century. Fortunately, in spite of all the burning of ancient and medieval manuscripts, Arab shipping in both the Mediterranean Sea and Indian Ocean is well documented. There are surviving narratives in Arabic describing voyages in ancient and medieval times. There are paintings, wrecks, or later copies of some of these ships, as well as Ramanat, or books of nautical instructions. Da Fatir, sailing direct, directions, and Suwar, expertly drafted sailing charts. There are historical records of splendid Arab naval victories, like the one against the Byzantine fleet, 500 ships strong, in A.D. 655. We have already drawn attention to the Arab influence on European shipping via the Mediterranean. The invention by the Arabs of the Latin sail, which Columbus and Vespucci used on their caravels. We should also make mention of the refinement and later transmission of the magnetic needle as a mariner's compass from China to the Mediterranean by the Arabs in the age of the Crusades. Their influence on European as well as on African shipping was considerable. The Mtepe is an East African version of an ancient Arab ship. Just as the main nautical instruments used by Columbus were European versions of early Arab inventions and transmissions. The Arab ship dramatized above with six stone anchors, rowing boats large enough to tow the ship in a calm crews of 400, sails as large as clouds, in ocean in the 10th century. Such ships were ten times larger than any ship Columbus sailed to the Americas. It was in the 10th century that Arab ships were reported to have visited Atlantic islands. We find this report in the works of the Nubian geographer. Idrisi. The Third Climate, A.D. 1151. The Atlantic islands referred to, however, were just the Canary Islands. There the Arabs who had set out from Lisbon found to their surprise that speakers of Arabic had already preceded them. They came upon, quote, an Arab interpreter to the king of the Canary Islands." End quote. There is evidence also that they had visited and charted all the islands in the North Atlantic, not just the Canaries, but the Cape Verde Islands and the Azores. A geography of the world published in Europe in A.D. 1350 by a Franciscan friar lists all of these islands 
and they are all given Arabic names. This merely proves, however, that Arabs were navigating in the Atlantic. The one remarkable piece of cartographic evidence confirming pre-Columbian contact with America lies in the map of the famous Turkish admiral Piri Reis. The Piri Reis map was discovered in 1929 in the old imperial palace of Istanbul. It was painted by Piri Reis on parchment in the year 1513 from maps partially destroyed in the library at Alexandria. Parts of the reconstruction are probably not as old as the sack of Alexandria itself. Who is to say that Perry Reese did not add to the ancient materials? The question inevitably arises, could he not have inserted the South American continent since, at the time of the reconstruction of the map, South America had already been visited by Vespucci, June 1499, and Cabral, April 1500. There is something unexplainable, however, about this map. Europeans did not rediscover the technique of determining longitude until the mid-18th century. Maps drawn more than 200 years after Columbus do not show South America in its proper relationship to Africa. Yet this map, redrawn in the Arab world in 1513, features the accurately <clears throat> charted east coastline of South America in its right longitudinal relationship with the Atlantic coast of the Old World, Africa. Also, it has Cairo, capital of the Arab world, as the center and base for its global computations. The astronomical and navigational knowledge demonstrated in the Perry Reese map is so astonishing that no map until those of the 20th century surpasses it in terms of the precision of its latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates in the representation of coastlines of Africa and South America. Clearly, it was drawn by a people who saw South America before Columbus. A people, moreover, who knew how to plot latitude and longitude. Only the Chinese and the Arabs mastered this knowledge long before the era of Columbus. A recent find in South America seems to suggest an Arab presence there as early as the 8th century AD. Quote, Off the coast of Venezuela, was discovered a hoard of Mediterranean coins with so many duplicates that it cannot well be a numismatist collection, but rather a supply of cash. Nearly all the coins are Roman, from the reign of Augustus to the 4th century AD. Two of the coins, however, are Arabic of the 8th century AD. It is the latter which gives us the terminus a quo, i.e. time after which, of the collection as a whole, which cannot be earlier than the latest coins in the collection. Roman coins continued in use as a currency into medieval times. A Moorish ship seems to have crossed the Atlantic around A.D. 800. Because Roman and Arab coins were not only in use by Romans and Arabs, this evidence cannot stand alone. It is supportive but not conclusive. The evidence we shall present to establish contact is historical. Sung Dynasty Documents Agricultural The pre-Columbian transmission to Africa and Asia of American Zimes and linguistic Arab words in Africa, Asia and Europe for the maize plant 
as well as 77 clan names and place names shared by the Berbers of North Africa and a group of American Indian tribes. We shall see, however, from our examination of this evidence that the Arabs returned home rather than settle in America, and hence, like the Vikings, left a very negligible influence upon Aboriginal Americans. We shall discover also such a strong Negroid element among the Arab African mariners, an element numerically if not politically dominant, that as a consequence there are no skeletal remains or traces or cultural influence in America that can be distinguished from the earlier or later African Negro presence with but one signal exception. This exception is in the area of family and tribal names. And here we shall see the very strong possibility that the shared nomenclatures of the North American Berbers and a number of American Aboriginal tribes were as much the result of journeys by Americans to Africa as the reverse. Of these journeys by Americans to the Old World, there are four documented instances. And the American Aborigines, unlike the Arabs, lack the capacity to return home, thereby leaving a marked influence through settlement, which influence extends beyond a linguistic to a physical and architectural presence in some Berber villages. Let us first look at the case for an Arab journey to America and back. A Chinese professor, Hui Lin Lai, presented a paper to the American Oriental Society in 1961. In this paper, Professor Lai highlighted two geographical works of the Song Dynasty, the Ling Wei Teita. 1178 by Chao Chu Fei and Chu Fan Chi 1225 by Chao Zhu Kua. These are documents on the Chinese and Arab trade in the 12th and 13th centuries. Both works claim that Arab ships headed west of Tashin the extremity of the Mohammedan world, which would be the Atlantic coastline of Africa, and traveling on a great sea, sailing due west for a full 100 days, discovered a new country. The Chinese knew the Arabs as Tashi, and extended that term to embrace the dominion over which they had political or spiritual influence. Tashi came to stand for the Arab Muslims as well as the Arab Mohammedan world. The ocean west of that world would become the Atlantic. One hundred days sailing by a large, slow ship across the Atlantic from an Arab port sailing due west could only bring one to America. It should be noted that the journey takes almost twice as long as that by an African small boat. But allowance should be made for the calms. Thus, Lindemann and Bombard made it to America in African-type boats in just a little more time than it took Amerigo Vespucci in his caravel. The boats that sailed for a hundred days west of Tashi, according to the Chinese, carried several hundred men to a boat. This is no exaggeration. Buzerg has recorded that large Arab ships of this period could carry on average 400 men. Both the Sung geographers derived their information from Arab merchants who visited the trading ports of southern China translating foreign products into Chinese equivalents 
and transcribing foreign place names into Chinese sounds. End quote. They described the ships that made the journey and the things they found there, particularly plants not familiar to the Arabs or Chinese. The new country indicated in the Sung documents was known as Mulan Pai, which may be translated as land reached by great ships. These ships sailed both the southern and western seas. Hui Lin Lai, on the strength of all the references in the Sung documents, identifies the Southern Sea as the Indian Ocean and the Western Sea as the Atlantic Ocean. A sea so vast that there was nothing to be seen for a hundred days of continuous sailing and which was entered on from a seaport west of Tashi, the westernmost part of the Muslim world, a seaport just off North Africa, could only be the Atlantic. The following passage from Chao Chi Fei, translated by Friedrich Hirth and W. W. Rockhill, gives a detailed account of these large ships. The bracketed insertions are mine, but are backed upon Professor Lai's interpretations. Quote, the ships which sailed the southern sea, Indian Ocean, brackets, and south of it are like houses. When their sails are spread, they are like great clouds in the sky. Their rudders are several tens of feet long. A ship carries several hundred men. It has stored on board a year's supply of grain. The big ship, with its heavy cargo, has naught to fear of the great waves, but in shallow water it comes to grief. Far beyond the western sea of the Arabs' countries, brackets, Atlantic Ocean, lies the land of Mulan Pai. Its ships brackets, that is, the ships which sail there, are the biggest of all. One ship carries a thousand men. On board are weaving looms and marketplaces. If it does not encounter favorable winds, it does not get back to port for years. No ship, but a very big one, could make such voyages. At the present time, the term Mulan Chao is used brackets in China to designate the largest kind of ship. Hearth and Rockhill, the first translators of the Sung Dynasty documents, thought that, to judge from the reports, the crops of the new country were so exaggerated in size and abnormal appearance that they either gave them incongruous locations or dismissed them as fantasies. An assiduous reinspection of the weights, appearance, and storage properties of some of the plants seen in the land reached by these ships has helped Professor Lai to identify some of them as New World products. Of those mentioned by the first geographer, Chow, 1178, there are three which are distinctive, a large grain, a large gourd, and a strange sheep. A cereal grain three inches long, Hui Lin Lai comments, is indeed something unusual, and this one has the property of surviving long storage. This strange cereal cannot be wheat, rice, barley, or even rye or oats, all of which are not only of smaller size, but were familiar enough to both the Chinese and the Arabs, 
at that time not to have aroused special interest. Judging from its large size and distinctive storage properties, the grain described is apparently maize or Indian corn. Z maize, an American plant, its grains are much larger than any of the cereals of the old world, and because of its very low protein content, it can be stored for a long time, a characteristic which would certainly have impressed old world observers. Chow also describes a gigantic gourd which was, quote, big enough to feed 20 or 30 persons. This Professor Lai identifies as the pumpkin, a plant of American origin. These gourds attain a great size, some varieties occasionally weighing as much as 240 pounds. There are large gourds of old world origin. Professor Lai points out such as the watermelon and the wax gourd. But these would not have been singled out for special mention because they were long known to both the Arabs and the Chinese. In addition to the strange cereal and gourd cited by Chao Chufei, 1178, the later geographer, Chao Ju Kwa, twelve twenty five, gives four other unusual plant products. A quote, pomegranate weighing five katis, a peach weighing two katis, a citron weighing over twenty katis, and a lettuce weighing as much as over 10 katis. There are a number of plants unknown to the old world at the time of Chao Juqua, with which these four items might be identified. Fruits of American origin Long cultivated in the northern part of South America The avocado The cherimoya the sweet sop, the sour sop, the guava, the papaya, and the pineapple grow to a substantial size. Some, like the pineapple, may weigh as much as six pounds. This makes the unusual weights assigned by Xiao Juqua to his several strange fruits come within reasonable bounds. Professor Lai, on the strength of the weights and descriptions, tentatively identifies the pomegranate as the several species of anona, that is, the sweet sop, sour sop, and cherimoya, the peach as the avocado or papaya, the citron as the pineapple. With respect to the lettuce, Hui Lin Lai comments, the lettuce cited by Chow could be the South American tobacco plant. Chinese lettuce is an often leafy plant, more resembling the tobacco plant in general appearance than the lettuce plant of the Western world. It is used by the Chinese as a salad and both the fleshy stem and the green leaves are eaten either pickled or raw. Tobacco is now known to most people in the form of the aged and processed leaves used for smoking, chewing, or snuff taking, but it should be noted that the cured leaves can also be used immediately for chewing, a practice which very likely was in more general usage among the American Indians in former times. The comparison of the tobacco plant to the lettuce plant is, therefore, not too far-fetched. In addition to the plant products, both Chow and Chow spoke of sheep 
of unusual height with large tails. Professor Lai identifies these as the llama and alpaca, which are not really sheep, but which, in some respects, so closely resemble the sheep of the old world that they have been mistaken as such even by travelers in post-Columbian times. They are, according to Professor Lai, two domesticated breeds in South America of the wild guanaco, one being bred as a beast of burden and the other for its wool. They are members of the camel family, although they lack humps. They closely resemble a sheep except for the long erect neck, which makes them look much taller than sheep. Both the llama and alpaca also have large tails. The unusual height and the large tail are features particularly emphasized by Chao Chu Fei. The strange cereal cited by the Sun geographers as three inches long and with the pro property of surviving long storage was in all likelihood Zimes or American corn as it is more popularly known. Maize or American corn has been firmly established as an indigenous American plant but there is equally firm evidence that it traveled to the old world in pre-Columbian times. Professor M. D. W. Jeffries, formerly attached to Whitwaterstrand University, has pursued the matter of pre-Columbian maize in the old world for the last 20 years. He cites a number of archaeological and botanical fields and unravels a remarkable tapestry of linguistic threads running across Africa and Asia and Europe that form too consistent a web of clues to be summarily brushed aside. He dismisses, first of all, the popular assumption that the Portuguese and the Dutch introduced maize into Africa after their acquaintance with America. There seemed at first to be clear confirmation of this assumption in the names for maize distributed along the Guinea coast. These maize names which are linked to vernacular stems used by Africans to refer to Europeans, strangers, white men, were thought to indicate that Europeans, the Portuguese and Dutch, had introduced maize into Africa in the early 16th century after the discovery of America. Jeffries had shown that the terms were in use long before the arrival of the Europeans and that they were used to refer to Arabs as well as Berbers and Arab Berber, Arab Negroid light skin mixtures. The Portuguese raid for slave on the Guinea coast in 1444, for example, records that when African captives in the mid-15th century were exposed for sale in Lagos, Portugal, it was truly a thing astonishing to behold, for among them were some well-nigh white, others were black as Ethiopians. It would be absurd to assume, argues Jeffries, that these people, well nigh white, had no name among the black Africans until the latter encountered the Portuguese. The word Turawa, for example, Tur means Arab, Awa means people, mentioned by Ibn Battuta as early as the mid 14th century and the record of his visit to Mali is also in many West African languages Nupe, Kapa, Ebe, Hansa, Kambali, Guru, and Moni to cite just a few the general term for quote, white man other popular stems and their variants found in maize names such as Boro, Boro 
Poro, Puru, Pura, Poto, Putu, and so on, were thought to be exclusive reference to Europeans, that is, the Portuguese. Porteres' interpretation of the term Puto, Coels of Poro, and Wieners of Aboro, are all part of the same mistake. Jeffries shows that the similarity between the sound put in African vernaculars and the sound port and put in Portuguese is purely coincidental. The Arabs, for example, have clearly been established as the distributors of the plantain and banana in West Africa. The Vi, a West African tribe, called the banana Poro banana, which is the banana of the Poro, the stem Poro standing in this case for the Arab, as in later times it came to stand for the Portuguese and other Europeans. The case is amply demonstrated with both the plantain and banana names, using the following tribes as test cases, the Mano, Kisi, Shi, Uwa, Ga, Fante, Crepe, Ashante, and Casina. Further, the pre-Columbian Arab trade in spices and the aromatic seed Afra Momum led to a number of African names for these spices and aromatics in which these stems reappear linking their origin to the Arabs. For example, among the Yoruba and Igbo of Nigeria and the Aku of Sierra Leone stems which are terms for Arabs. Polo, Boro, Opolo, Aboru may be found in the names for a number of Arab trade items. It would be strange indeed if so many people trading in plantains, bananas, spices, peppers, and perfumes had to wait for the Portuguese to arrive before inventing names for these. No African maize name, which is usually a compound of the name for the local sorghum and the name of the people from whom maize was obtained, connects the European unequivocally with the introduction of maize. Even the Pongwe, whose word for maize is associated with a phrase meaning people of the sun, cannot be shown to have got maize from the Europeans, as Professor Porteres has claimed. The phrase people of the sun is widespread in Africa and is pre-European. It was used to refer to those Egyptian pharaohs who were light-skinned. Not only have these claims, like those of Willett and Porteres, that there is a linguistic link between the Portuguese and Maize in West Africa, been exposed by Jeffries as untenable, but historical documents of the Portuguese and the Dutch themselves show that the equally insistent claim that Maize first arrived in Africa across the Atlantic, having been brought from the Guyanas and Brazil by Portuguese and Dutch vessels to the Guyanese coast has no foundation. The discovery of Brazil by the Portuguese explorer Alvarez Cabral in 1500 makes no mention of maize, and Cabral did not sail to Guyana from Brazil but went direct to Calicut in India where he stayed for a while to found a trading station. Even the possibility of his taking maize to India must be ruled out, because there maize is known by the same name as in East Africa, the Sorghum of Mecca. Another Portuguese expedition visited Brazil in 1501, but not the Guinea coast. As for the Dutch, their visits to America were later still, and 1595 was the year of their first expedition to West Africa. But what of the Spanish? Surely Columbus could have brought maize grains to Spain. 
Brazil, after all, was not the exclusive home of Zimes, and the Portuguese and the Dutch were not the only potentially maize carrying Europeans to set foot on West African soil in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Willett contends, quote, In 1493, Columbus probably introduced maize from Haiti into Spain. Certainly, Mahitz or Marichi arrived in Spain from Cuba in 1520, although its cultivation appears to have been attempted in Seville in 1500. End quote. On the first point, Jeffries shows that Columbus did not, at that date, 1493, introduce maize into Spain. He quotes P. Weatherwax, who notes that it maize is generally supposed to be among the New World curiosities taken back by Columbus on his return from the first voyage and purely imaginary pictures of the admirable admiral being received by Ferdinand and Isabella sometimes show ears of corn. We have searched the old chronicles with some care on this point and have failed to find any explicit support for this quite plausible inference. Jefferies also points to this lack of evidence for a post-Columbian introduction of maize highlighted by the Italian Bertignoli, who, writing in 1881, states, quote, It is generally accepted that maize was imported from America by the Spaniards. But this opinion is not substantiated by any definite documents. End quote. Even if the Spanish had brought maize to Guyana in 1496, it could not account for what the evidence suggests. That as early as 1500, maize was already a staple crop and regular food on the Guyana coast. By 1502, it was helping, it was being exported to San Tome. The first reference to this exportation of maize from Guyana coast was made by the Portuguese Valentin Fernandez, who in 1506 said that maize, Fernandez used the term Zaburo, which will be discussed later, was exported from the Guyana coast to San Tome and grown there for the first time in 1502. Fernandez, describing the Wolof, whose country lay between the Senegal and Gambia rivers, also remarked, quote, They eat rice, of which they have little. Of maize, they have much. The Mandingos, the largest group in this area, were also noted in this reference as cultivators of Milo Zaburo. Some critics of Jeffries had suggested that maize could be confused with African sorghum, and that Fernandez's use of Zaboro for maize is not conclusive. The distinction between sorghum and maize, however, was known, or rather, sorghum was too well known to be confused with maize. It had been cultivated in the Iberian Peninsula for some centuries before 1502 and acquired its own names there. Names for sorghum are mentioned by the Arab writer Debin al-Awan in his treatise on agriculture in the Iberian Peninsula, Kitab al-Falawa, published in 1158 in Seville. In Spain, Sorghum was and still is known as Malika, Sagina, Mazorca, Mazaroca, and in Portuguese as Sorgo or Mayora. <clears throat> Why, asked Jeffries, should Fernandez use Zaburo for sorghum, which has its own separate constellation of names? The term Zaburo was further qualified by Fernandez 
milho, sapuro, y grate. To indicate the extraordinarily large maize grain that an anonymous Portuguese pilot to Guyana, according to Sergei Savaglat, described in 1520 as being of the size of chickpeas. Much of the early maize of West Africa, Jeffrey's notes, was flint maize, whose grains are generally large, and the only cereal in the high rainfall areas of the West African coast which produces a grain comparable in size with chickpeas is maize. There is also another and more serious argument against the possible confusion of sorghum with maize. Jeffries contends that cultivated sorghum is not able to grow in the rainforest regions where maize flourishes. The sorghum grains in the humid climate are rapidly attacked by mildew. The Portuguese pilot paid five visits to San Tome, describing the maze there in considerable detail. He also commented that it was everywhere. While it is true that the pilot's visits and references post-date Fernandez by about fifteen years, there could not possibly have been a shift from heavy sorghum cultivation to ubiquitous maize cultivation in the intervening period. Dr. H. Lanz E. Silva said of the pilot's evidence that the Zuburo he describes certainly does not refer to sorghum but to Z maize, whose grains can roughly be compared with those of Lathyrus cicera, which is indigenous in the south of Europe and therefore known to the author. An earlier Portuguese reference suggesting the pre-Columbian cultivation of maize in Guyana comes from a record of the ordinances of the Portuguese king Manuel, 1495 to 1521, who allowed for the purchase of maize from Guyana by those ships that were sent to embark slaves at San Tomé. An even earlier dating is given by Santa Rose de Viterbo, who, in his supplement to the Elucidario, written in 1798 on the authority of earlier writers, states that maize was brought into Portugal in the reign of King John 1481 to 1495 after the discovery of Guyane. A considerable number of references are quoted by Jeffries to demonstrate the widespread cultivation of maize along the Guyana coast in the 16th century. These other references, however, while they certainly establish the ubiquity of maize and its use as a staple food in West Africa, are too late. I feel to be of value in this argument. What is more relevant and persuasive is his contention that the Portuguese terms for maize are African terms, and that on finding maize in the Americas, the Portuguese neither invented new names for it, nor did they adopt the local American Indian name. Rather, they referred to maize as Milho de Gaiani or Zapuro. Jules Cesar Seelinger, as early as 1557, stated that the word Zabur for a cereal was of African origin. He remarked, quote, My Liam is called by the Ethiopians Zabur, by the Arabs Dora. Jeffries, in an article on Zabudo, shows that the evidence points to the origin of the word among the Akan, a Twi speaking people 
who he claims acquired maize from the Arabs while in the Jen Timbuktu region circa 1300 and acquired the name at the same time because the Twi, Fante, and Asante do not have the Z sound in their languages. Zabudo would appear in these languages as Abudo. Over a wide area, Za and its variants mean Sorghum, and Boro and Buro are variants of the term for Arab. The Zabudo or Aburo means sorghum of the Arab. Even in East Africa, among the Sian Gazija, the term for maize is Mrama Buro, which means the sorghum of the Buro, where the word Buro would never be taken to mean anyone but an Arab. The possible alternative origin of this word, Zaburo, from Serburo, meaning cattle fodder, has also been considered by Jeffries. The possibility does not upset his case. The early use of maize for fodder may have easily led to the phonetic and semantic fusion of these verbal twins, Zaburo, Seburo. Leo Wiener quotes Soares de Souza as saying in 1587 that, quote, In all of Brazil, there is a native plant which the Indians call Ubatim, maize, which is Guyana millet, and which in Portugal is called Zabudo. The Portuguese in Brazil plant this millet with which to feed the horses, cattle, chickens, goats, sheep, and pigs." End quote. In Italy, notes Jeffries, quoting Berta Cagnoli, quote, Maize at first was grown as a food for cattle. End quote. Jeffries has followed the trail of maize across the vast areas of Africa, west, east, and south finally to Asia and Asia Minor, the empire of the Turks and Saracens, and from Asia Minor to Europe. The evidence he unearths is not simply based on linguistics, that is, names for maize, but also on archaeological finds, such as the Goodwin finds at the al Ife. The summers and wild finds in the Inyanga ruins of Mano Motapa, now Rhodesia, and the Vishnu Mitre and Gupta finds in India, all pre Columbian. A. J. H. Goodwin in 1953 reported that pots decorated by rolling a maize cob over wet clay were found at Ile Ife, Yoruba territory in Nigeria. Goodwin noted, quote, as vast numbers of specimens were collected from a pavement of potsherds that provided a clear dating line for certain sites, it became important to note whether or not the maize cob decoration occurred. It did. And it is abundantly clear that this particular paving is subsequent to the introduction of maize. End quote. This pavement was laid while Ile Ife was the ritual capital of the Yoruba kings. No more precise dating is given, although there is no question that the pavement is pre Columbian. Jeffrey's attempts to date it and the maize cob potsherds found on its surface by reference to Yoruba traditions. These traditions, according to R. F. Burton, state that maize was introduced among the Yoruba by yellow-skinned foreigners who crossed the Niger from the northeast. This would rule out Europeans as 
bringers of maize to Africa, since apart from the fact that they do not fit the physical description, they came much later and from the West. Maize, according to Yoruba traditions, recorded by Baba Lola, arrived in Yoruba land while the Ile Ife was still the capital. Talbot writes that between A.D. 600 and A.D. 1000, a wave of immigrants from the caste invaded Yoruba land and made Ile Ife their capital. But later this capital was moved to Old Oil. Jeffrey says, quote, If now one takes the latest date for the invasion, as say, A.D. 1000, and the Old Oil was founded around A.D. 1100, then it would appear that somewhere about this time maize appeared among the Yoruba. Jeffries has done another important test to confirm the Yoruba oral traditions that maize reached them from the northeast. As one progresses inland from the coast, he notes, the tribal names for maize indicate the route by which it migrated. Thus, the name for maize in Tribe A is the sorghum of Tribe X, and where X is found ultimately to be the name of a tribe east or north of the receiving Tribe A. Two or three examples may make this clearer. The Hagi, receiving their maize from the Konori, call it the sorghum of the Konori to distinguish it from their local brand of sorghum. African sorghum. The Jakun, receiving it from the Pabir, call it the sorghum of the Pabir. And the Yakutare, received it from the Kwona, called it the sorghum of the Kwona, and so on. The evidence Jeffries presents for pre Columbian maize in East Africa is equally impressive. The Arabs were trading on the East African sea coast from Sofala to Arabia long before the Portuguese had rounded the Cape of Good Hope. The Arabs penetrated far inland, for when the Portuguese first visited Zimbabwe, then the capital of Mono Motapa, the present Rhodesia, they found Arabs already established there. Jeffrey shows that, starting from Sofala and proceeding north, along the coast until Madras in India is reached. All the names for maize among the coastal tribes of East Africa are connected with the Arabs. V. Dalmedia, the first viceroy of India, noted on his arrival at Kilwa on the East African coast in 1505 that that city had plenty of milho like that of Guyane. The Portuguese had for centuries known what sorghum was like, but here at Kilwa was a grain like that found on the coast of Guinea. Again, it must be pointed out that 200 inches of rain fall on the coast of Guinea, and so no cultivated sorghum will grow, but maize grows and produces two crops a year. Hence it follows that the remark by the Almedia, Milo, or grain, like that of the Gaini, can point only to maize. In 1505, then, maize was a staple crop in places as far apart as Kilwa, East Africa, and the Gaini coast, West Africa. Chinese sources established an even earlier date for maize in East Africa. Doi Vindak mentions that the Chinese between 1405 and 1422 sent six expeditions by sea to East Africa. These Chinese navigators sent back reports of things seen there, among which were an unknown cereal with extraordinary large ears, a vegetarian tiger, which has been identified as the African zebra, 
and sweet dew. With respect to the first item, it should be noted that the Chinese were well acquainted with the old world cereals, rice, wheat, barley, and sorghum, none of which carry extraordinary large ears. Therefore, one is forced to the conclusion that the cereal referred to was maize. The size of maize would strike the Chinese, who, according to the botanist Alphonse de Candole, have annually since 2200 B.C. ceremonially sown five kinds of seeds, wheat, rice, sorghum, ceteria, italica, and soy, none of which, it must be repeated, carry extraordinarily large ears. How and when maize got to China is another intriguing side to the story. The first European to reach Mozambique around the Cape, Vasco da Gama, recorded maize there in March 1498. In an account of the capture of two boats in the Mozambique Channel, da Gama wrote, In the one we took we found seventeen men, besides gold, silver, and an abundance of maize, milho, and other provisions. The word milho, Jeffreys claims, on the strength of all the documents he has examined, was the standard Portuguese official name for maize, and was used for maize in the early records of the Portuguese administration. Recordings of maize in southern Africa by Europeans are all post-15th century but they are well before the movement of the Europeans as settlers into that area. They found maize already growing there when they arrived. Reports in the 16th century attest to the pre-European presence of maize in southern Africa, accounts of a shipwreck on the South African coast in 1554, and of a murdered priest at Zimbabwe, now Rhodesia, in 1561, both tell of a cereal in terms that leave little doubt as to its identity as maize. A survivor of the wreck of the Esperanca in 1554, Manuel Perestrello, not only uses the term milho zapuro for the grain offered by the Africans at the mouth of the Pascaria River, but the priest who was murdered Father Gonzalo de Siviera was noted in a Portuguese account for his daily consumption of roasted grain cooked with herbs. A detail that distinguishes maize from African sorghum. This is so because Indian corn, maize, in South Southern Africa, unlike Kafir corn, African sorghum, is roasted on the heads in the embers and eaten parched in hot ashes or cooked with herbs and served as a vegetable relish, which is still the practice among the Bantu today. Further evidence of pre-Columbian maize in South Africa has been found in the Ayanga ruins of Mano Motapa. The Inyanga site was abandoned in the 15th century, according to R. Summers. H. Wilde, in his botanical report on these ruins, states, Portions of a maize cob, Z. maize, were found on the surface of a grinding place on Site 4, although no actual seeds were discovered. How did maize reach southern Africa before the Dutch or the Portuguese? As a consequence of the movement, says Jeffreys, of two Bantu tribes, the Nguni and the Bavenda, from East Africa into central southern Africa. Jeffreys traced the names for maize among these migrating Bantu tribes, and he found that South African Bantu tribes either have stems 
of the Nguni words for maize and maize loaf or called maize by a similar name to that by which they knew the Nguni while the maize words of the Bavenda tribe form a linguistic island that is are words used for maize only by the Bavenda this clearly suggests that the Nguni arrived with maize before the Bavenda came and in disseminating this crop disseminated the maize names linked with them Arab trade in the Indian Ocean closely linked the East African coastal territories with the world of India and China the pre-Columbian appearance of maize in India therefore can be explained in the same way Chinese documents of the Ming Dynasty the Pun Sao Kang Mu the Nong Chang Xuan Shu and the K Chi King Wan also point to a pre-Columbian introduction from territory west of China the latter document specifically pinpointing Kan Su where there was a large settlement of Arabs in 1928 the Russian botanist N. N. Kuleshov published the results of his investigations into maize in Asia these results point to a feature in Asiatic maize which if it is a mutation of the American plant would call for an earlier cultivation of maize in Asia than the time of the first landing by the Portuguese on the shores of Asia in 1516 the facts which were established by us Kuleshov and Vavilov return us anew to this supposition and this time with a great deal of conviction maize names in India all suggest an Arab introduction in the whole of southern India says Sri P. Krishna Rao in a personal letter to Professor Jeffries maize is known as Mecca Sorghum the word sorghum being rendered into the respective local Indian language the names all strongly point to the fact that maize has come from Mecca Mecca here refers not to a specific place but to the symbolic heartland of the Arab Mohammedan world the Vishnu Maitra and Gupta finds are the strongest evidence supporting the pre-Columbian presence of maize in Asia Vishnu Maitra describing carbonized food grains and their impressions on potsherds from Kuandinyapur an archaeological site in Madhya Pradesh North India wrote that quote the evidence of maize in India is not in any case later than 1435 AD and tends to establish its pre-Columbian age end quote from both Asia and Asia Minor which circa 1320 was the empire of the Muslim Turks and Saracens may spread to Europe and hence it is referred to in European countries as Turkish wheat Saracen wheat wheat of Asia or Arabian wheat Turk was once the generic name for the Arab in the Mediterranean thus we have Grano Turco, Grano Saraceno, Fumentum Saracenium, Fumentum Asiaticum, Italy, Turkish corn, Tartarian wheat, Great Britain, Turks Tarway, Holland, Turkish Saved, Sweden, Turetsky Chelb, Russia, Fumentum Asiaticum, Germany, Ble de Turkey, France, Shirkia, Morocco, and Arab site, Greece. The pre Columbian appearance of maize in Asia is well known. 
botanists who knew nothing of the African pre-Columbian evidence unearthed by Jeffries were claiming an Asian origin for the grain. In fact, no one ever suggested that maize was originally brought to Europe from America in the first 30 years of the discussion of the plant. Europe, as Jeffries has shown, has almost all of its names for maize associated with Asia. That part of Asia within the pre-Columbian Mohammedan world. Asia, on the other hand, has no names for maize associated with America or Europe. Even in Spain, an early name for maize was Trigo de Turquia. Not the American word maize. From the Arawak maize, and in Portugal, as mentioned earlier, it was referred to as the Gaini wheat. To return to the central question, how did maize get to Africa, to Asia, to Asia Minor, and to Europe in pre-Columbian times? Who originally brought it from America, and when and how? Jeffries has suggested expeditions, return journeys, across the Atlantic by Arab Africans to account for the pre-Columbian presence of American maize in the Old World. A thesis published in Algiers in 1930 by a French commandant, Jules Cave, lends further support to this suggestion. While involved in another study, Cove noticed that the ethnic names of certain Berber groups were the same as those of certain American Indian tribes. The Berbers are a mixed race of Arabs who live in North Africa. They originally came from Northern Asia, India, and the Caucasus, and have also mingled with Negroid tribes in the Saharan deserts. They lived in the medieval period at the northern boundary of the Mali Empire and paid allegiance to the black emperors of Mali. Because of their original Asian background, before their intermingling with other Caucasoid and Negroid elements, Covey found it necessary to cross-check Asian ethnic names to see whether these similar names among the Berbers and the Americans rose as a consequence of a simultaneous arrival of groups from Asia. This check could not explain these astonishing parallels. Few could be accounted for by virtue of the early Asiatic element in the Berber background. Certain American ethnic names, Calvet said, are only duplicated among the Berbers and are not found anywhere else in the world. Certain other American names have undergone Berber transformations. The origin of a number of names is attested by the grouping of names of collectives in the vicinity of their point of origin. Calvet examined the origins of 77 such similar names of tribes on both sides of the Atlantic. Among the 77, he was able to distinguish five categories. Of the 77, he found as many as 46 names of American tribes that seemed to come directly from Africa. He cites the following examples in this category. The Aslantecas of America. The Atlantis mentioned in Herodotus. The Baquetas, the ancient Bakuatis, the Barkas, the Barkajana mentioned by Arab writers, the Bukoyas, the Bukoya of the Rift in North Africa, the Gwesnes, the Gwesna of the Rift, the Gwalis, the Gwelia of the Rift, the Chorti, the Chorta mentioned by Arab writers, the Gomeres, the Gomara of the Rif and the island Gomera, the Guanches, the Guanches of the Canary Islands, the Huares, the Huara of Morocco, etc. Calvet 
survey explains how some of these names found among Americans belong to inland as well as coastal Atlantic Berbers. Berber tribes moved around. Inland tribes took part in expeditions organized by coastal tribes. Arab African expeditions to America drew upon people from all over the Berber complex in Africa. In the other four categories of names, he places those which certainly came from the East, but might have got to America from Europe as well as from the Berbers. Examples are the Antis, Torres, Dorans, Gobelins, Gis, Jabaros, Lippis, Parisis, Syracus, Samagotos, Tames, Zamoras. Those that are also Berber, but seem certainly to have come to the Americas from Europe. Campus and Utes. Those that might equally have come from Asia as from Africa. Chorus, Chalcus, Cochines, Katamas. And those whose origins remain unsure, but are found nonetheless duplicated in America and North Africa. The Amel Cetus, Caesaris, Pharaonis, Georgesinos, Matamatis, and Outtaouts. Covey's study is massive. It runs to half a thousand pages. These, in brief, however, are his main discoveries. Some of the ethnic names he has turned up could have traveled to America during the medieval contact period between Africans and Americans. One is the Galabese, for a small tribe in Brazil in the province once known as Portuguese Guyana. From the Galabese in the Mali University town of Timbuktu. Another is the Marabitine tribe of the Sudan, which he compares with the Mara Batinas and the Mara Vitinas, also a former Portuguese Guyana in Brazil. Mara Bios, Nicaragua, and the Mara Vigane, Venezuela. There are many more, but these should suffice. Anthropologists have often found ethnic names important in following the migrations of peoples. Like the names of individuals, they are the last linguistic elements to go, even after the foreign tongue has been abandoned, forgotten, or absorbed. Linguistic studies among the Gula blacks in the Sea Islands, for example, although related only to post-Columbian migrations, show how thousands of West African names have been retained as secret names among them. People drop a great deal when they settle in an alien environment and intermarry with the women or the culture of native populations. The last thing they drop, however, is names. Names can therefore often be used to track down their identities as detectives track down the identities of suspects from fingerprints. But these many identities and names are not simply the result of one migration of Arabs or Africans to America, nor in fact to a one-way traffic of people and culture to the American continent. Calve does not rule out American contact with Africa and mentions four documented instances of Americans shipwrecked on the shores of the Old World. These were rather rare events, much rarer than African accidental shipwrecks because the pattern of winds and currents favors the possibility of the one over the other. Nevertheless, they sometimes happened. The Gulf Stream departing from Florida provides a return route back to North Africa and parts of Europe. At Spain, the Gulf Stream divides in two directions, one continuing around the British Isles on to Germany and Denmark, and the other bending south to Africa. This would explain American Aborigines being found in Berber territory in North Africa. Two anthropologists have demonstrated 
that certain people living in the Sahara possess American Indian traits. Not only do they have similar names and naming methods, but tribal groups are also designated by the same titles, differing only in the aspects of an occasional prefix or suffix. Furthermore, the women folk of the same region, in all appearance, could easily be mistaken for American Indians. These nomads reside in tents, rather than mud brick houses, as do most of their neighbors. Among the documented instances of Americans landing in the Old World is an incident in the life of Quintus Metellus Seller, governor of Cisalpine Gaul in 62 BC and governor-designate of Transalpine Gaul prior to his death in 59 BC. A chief from somewhere just outside of the Roman world made him a present of some shipwrecked sailors who created a sensation. After some communication could be established with them, they were questioned closely, and on the strength of this, Metellus concluded that they had been blown by a storm from, quote, Indian waters, and eventually cast up on a shore in Germany. This would agree with the drift of the Gulf Stream current from America, a branch of which proceeds to Germany. These so-called Indians were brought across the Alps from the Atlantic side by the Suevians, a tribe which lived in northeast and southwest Germany. The Americans were shipwrecked near the mouth of the Rhine and were taken up that river and across the Alps. Seller related the incident to a friend, Cornelius Naples. Naples included it in a geographical work which, though lost, was cited by subsequent historians Pomponius, Mela, and Pliny. Records of the incident were therefore preserved, and these writers used the information as proof that the ocean extended continuously around the north of Europe to India. One thing is certain, comments Professor J. V. Luce, who has investigated the matter, no one from India could have taken this route at this date. Where then? Did these shipwrecks come from? An examination of all the facts, drift of ocean currents, point of entry into Europe, physical appearance, etc., established them as Occidental Indians, that is, Americans, as against Oriental Indians, Asian from India. These Americans came too early to have been the carriers of the maize grain to the Old World, but they might have brought in the pineapple. Their visit occurred in 62 BC. About a hundred years later, 79 AD, a catastrophe struck the Roman city of Pompeii. Excavating under the volcanic dust, archaeologists turned up a mural which depicted this plant completely unknown in the old world. It has been confidently identified as the American pineapple by Casella, an authority on Pompeii, and has been accepted as such by plant taxonomist E. D. Merrill, who had argued in the past against pre-Columbian contact between the old and new worlds. It would be an irony indeed to find that Americans, quote, discovered Europe many centuries before Europeans, quote, discovered America. But the whole notion of any race, European, African, or American, discovering a full-blown civilization is absurd. Such notions should now be abandoned once and for all. They presume some innate superiority in the quote, discoverer, and something inferior and barbaric in the people, quote, discovered. These notions run through the works, even of pioneers like Wiener, Covey, 
and Jeffries. What I have sought to prove is not that Africans discovered America, but that they made contact on at least half a dozen occasions, two of which were culturally significant for Americans. The African presence in America before Columbus is of importance not only to African and American history but to the history of world civilizations. It provides further evidence that all great civilizations and races are heavily indebted to one another and that no race has a monopoly on enterprise and inventive genius. The African presence is proven by stone heads, terracottas, skeletons, artifacts, techniques and inscriptions, by oral traditions and documented history, by botanical, linguistic and cultural data. When the feasibility of African crossings of the Atlantic was not proven and the archaeological evidence, undated and unknown, we could in all innocence ignore the most startling of coincidences. This is no longer possible. The case for African contacts with pre-Columbian America, in spite of a number of understandable gaps and a few minor elements of contestable data, is no longer based on the fanciful conjecture and speculation of romantics. It is grounded now upon an overwhelming and growing body of reliable witnesses. Using Dr. Rhine's dictum for phenomena that were once questionable but are now being empirically confirmed, truly it may be said, the overwhelming incidence of coincidence argues overwhelmingly against a mere coincidence. End of chapter 12 Postscript on Other Finds The Negro started his career in America not as a slave, but as master. R. A. Jiraza Boy Ancient Egyptians and Chinese in America The startling fact is that in all parts of Mexico, from Campeche in the east to the south coast of Guerrero, and from Chiapas next to the Guatemalan border, to the Panuco River in the Huasteca region north of Veracruz, archaeological pieces representing Negro or Negroid people have been found, especially in archaic or pre-classic sites. This also holds true for large sections of Mesoamerica and far into South America. Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Alexander von Wuthenau Unexpected Faces in Ancient America I let the grains filter slowly through my fingers, like sand falling in a measured trip through the neck of an ancient hourglass. Some of the grains at the bottom of the grave reminded me of that sunless ashen powder one finds on the floor of abandoned ant heaps. They were mixed now with a darker, heavier, more brittle soil, but when the grave had first been opened, the layer in which I now buried my hands had been dated circa A.D. 1250. Within that layer had been found the bones of two negroid skeletons. I looked up from the pit, strewn with the irrelevant debris of beer and soda cans. 
at the pure unlittered pool of the Caribbean sky. My guide called down to me from the edge of the pit. Her voice was clear above the muffled hammer of the sea in the bay outside, and the closeness and immediacy of this vital cry against the whisper of the unseen ocean in Hull Bay flooded me with the sensation of the overlapping of the visible and the invisible, of modern substance and ancient shadow, of the far and the familiar centuries. I felt as though the hands through which I now sifted this thirteenth century dust were branches drawing sap from the grafted tree of my Carib and African ancestors. I had come to the Virgin Islands a year after the Smithsonian had reported the whole bay find. According to the Associated Press report on the discovery, the skeletons of two Negroid males in their late thirties had been found buried in soil layers, layers dated A.D. 1250. Clamped around the wrist of one of the skeletons was a ceramic vessel of pre-Columbian Indian design. Examination of the teeth of the skeletons indicated, quote, dental mutilation characteristic of early African cultures, end quote. The find must have generated considerable excitement at first, since the adjoining area of the grave had been acquired at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. By March 1976, however, when I visited the site, a blanket of secrecy had descended. The grave had degenerated into a garbage dump. I learned from information filtering out of the Smithsonian that interest had evaporated because the skeletons found in the grave could not be properly dated. Salt water had seeped into the bones, disturbing the carbon content, leading to wildly fluctuating readings of skeletal age. Also, and this is most revealing, a nail had been found near one of the skeletons. Indicating, said the informant, that the find was most certainly post-Columbian. Note: My visit to the Virgin Islands was sponsored jointly by the Environmental Studies Program on St. John and the College of the Virgin Islands on St. Thomas. Mrs. Doris Jaden, president of ESP, had invited me to study the petroglyphs carved at the bottom of an ancient freshwater pool in the Reef Bay Valley. Some of these I identified as African. The central plaque was distinguished from the others by the Gi Nami sign of Ashanti origin, a sign of power overturned and reasserted, as well as by a medieval West African dating code of solar dots and lunar curves inscribed along the waterline. End of note. In matters of this nature, it is wise for the Smithsonian to tread with great caution. The disturbance of the bones by seawater makes one aspect of the evidence inconclusive, but the other features, the pre-Columbian ceramic vessel, the age of the soil layers, the evidence of an unusual dental ritual not associated with African slavery times, strongly suggests a pre-Columbian context. In other words, nothing in the evidence associated with the skeletons suggests a post-Columbian dating. The find at Hull Bay remains, therefore, an open question. Further diggings in that area may establish the pre-Columbian presence of Africans in the Virgin Islands after all but the matter is being prematurely closed by a conspiracy of silence 
a spate of insidious rumors and by apparent ignorance of African metallurgical history. For to assume that a nail found beside an African skeleton is proof of a post columbian dating is absurd. Apart from the possibility of accidental intrusion from a higher stratum, such a tiny object can easily slip through a crack in the earth, the even more real possibility that pre columbian Africans were acquainted with iron nails has not been considered. Why should a nail pose insuperable problems to Africans whose smelting of iron dates back to 650 BC at Moreau in Nubia and to 200 BC at Nak in Nigeria? Are we to believe that the medieval West African who could devise metal implements refined enough to perform eye cataract surgery in the 13th century was incapable of making a nail? The find at Hull Bay, however, is only the most recent in a series of discoveries of negroid skeletal remains in pre-Columbian strata in the New World. I have already noted some of these among the Olmecs, as cited by Andres Wierzynski and Frederick Peterson, and the Pecos River Valley skulls of a later period, as cited by Ernest Houghton. Note. In fact, an isolated iron spearhead was found in Nubia by the David Randall McIver and C. L. Woolley archaeological team in a stratum dating back to the 12th dynasty. This is 400 years before tiny iron implements for use in ritual ceremonies appear in Egypt in the tomb of Tutankhamun, late 18th dynasty, and more than a thousand years before iron began to become common in the Egyptian world, which was in the 25th dynasty under the blacks. C. A. Lucas, Ancient Egyptian Materials and Industries London, Edward Arnold, 1926, pages 196 and 197. End of note. Some theorist, H. S. Gladwin in Men Out of Asia, and his latter day disciple, Legrand Clegg II, in his article, Who Were the First Americans? point to, quote, proto-negroid, or, quote, proto-australoid finds among some of the Pacific migrants to America 20,000 years ago. These finds are almost exclusively of an australoid pygmy type and are mostly confined to the Pacific coast. They cannot account for the presence, influence, and distinctive racial cultural characteristics of Negro African types found much later in either the Olmec or medieval Mexican cultures. They are therefore peripheral if not irrelevant to our study. In the first place they are different in stature and cephalic shape from the Olmec Negro types reported by Wierzynski at Tlatiklo Cerro de las Masas and Monte Alban. Second, they belong to a period in world history when the so-called quote Africoid or quote proto-Australoid base to use terms coined by these theorists could equally be traced even to some tribes in the Baltic region in northwestern Russia. Third, they had mixed and melted into the billion-bodied mongoloid gene pool for at least 20,000 years, to judge from the datings given to these very early remains of the glacial epoch. Far too long to emerge suddenly as clearly defined, highly distinctive Negro-African faces, such as we find in the colossal 
black dynasties of the Olmec civilization. Fourth, the Negro African portraitures in stone, clay, copper, gold, and cobalt found in pre-Columbian America are distinguishable as Nubian Egyptian and West African types not simply and solely on the ground of their Negroid physiognomy but because of identifiable cultural items helmets, coffers, headkerchiefs, caps, compound earrings, tattoos and scarification associated with particular historical periods and particular peoples. Also, they are found mainly among the Atlantic seaboard at the terminal points of winds and currents which bear from Africa all that remains flying and afloat, not only gourds and men and ships, but even the seasonal dust cloud drifting out of the great ocean of Sahara the Harmattan. The pre-Columbian blacks reported by Mongoloid Americans and enshrined in the oral traditions are clearly not the primitive quote proto-Australoids of the Ice Age. No oral traditions in the world go back that far. If they did, we would expect the Mongoloid Americans to preserve legends also of their primordial Pacific homelands before the crossing of the Bering Straits. The look at their oral traditions makes it very clear that the black figure to which they refer was an unusual outsider, in most cases an object of mystery and reverence, and moreover a figure who began to feature prominently in their world in historic times, that is, from the Olmec civilization onward. Unlike the short-statured Pacific Australoid Negrito, he was taller than the average Amerindian. Although the historian Carlos C. Marquez does make mention of a few, quote, small black men seen in Darien, now Panama, by the American tribes who first settled there. Nicholas Leon an eminent Mexican authority reports on the oral traditions of the Native Americans, according to some of whom, quote, the oldest inhabitants of Mexico were Negroes. The existence of Negroes and giants, he continues, is commonly believed by nearly all the races of our soil and in the various languages they had words to designate them. Several archaeological objects found in various localities demonstrate their existence. The most notable of which is the colossal granite head of Huayapan, Veracruz, and an axe of the same located near the city. And Teotihuacan a bound little head of the Ethiopian type and paintings of Negroes, and Mokokan and Oaxaca, the same have also been found. The reference to giants is interesting, since many continental Africans are much taller than the Native Americans. Vespucci mentions a strange race of tall men sighted on a Caribbean island now known as Corazal. And his distinguished biographer, Frederick Poole, believes that these men were blacks. In a letter to me, Poole wrote, quote, Vespucci is accredited first explorer to reach Corazal island of giants and did so in 1500s. His letter from Seville describes the giants, even the woman, as a head and a half. 
taller than any of the Spaniards with him. Spaniards in his day in Spain saw many Moors, and Indians were of a different color also. And so Negro giants were described only by height, not by color. A Medigo does give the color of the Indians of Trinidad in the same letter. His letter, written five or six months after his landing on Curacao, was to his patron in Florence, and he could easily have failed to put in details which he had given. After completing the present work, I fell upon an extraordinary little volume, which is really a chapter in a larger work, Old World Origins of American Civilization by R. A. Jerazaboy. Jerazaboy claims that the Olmecs burst in on the Mexican Gulf Coast circa 1200 B.C. and that it is just after their appearance that quote all kinds of civilized activity appears including massive organization of labor, a trade network, ceremonial centers with pyramids, colossal sculpture, relief carving, wall painting, orientation of structures, gods and religious symbolism, an obsession with the underworld, representation of foreign racial types, hieroglyphic writing, inscribes, seals and rings, use of iron, and so on. End quote. He attributes all these to Old World migrants who came to America in that period, circa 1200 B.C., but admits, quote, few artifacts so far found go back to the first generation migrants, end quote. In fact, none indicating an Old World influence do go back to 1200 B.C. Hard carbon datings of artifacts associated with outside influence begin in the 800 to 700 BC period, though the cultural complex known as Olmec has its beginnings in an earlier stratum, 1200 to 1100 BC. Because of Jerusalem's hypothesis that the journey from Egypt to the Gulf of Mexico had to be made circa 1200 BC to coincide with the first Olmec settlements, he is led into strange speculations about the role and fate of the black figure in the reign of Ramses III, the Egyptian pharaoh of the 1200 BC period. Since the Negroid figure, according to him, was a slave and mercenary in that period, but appears as a figure of great authority and power among the Olmecs, he speculates that they came to America under the supervision of northern Egyptian overlords and were either made military governors of the Olmec by these overlords of whom he admits there are no sculptural traces or that the blacks mutinied and killed their overlords. The latter suggestion is even more problematic since it would mean that all the complex Egyptian elements he mentioned were transplanted here by soldiers. The so-called overlords, which would include the high priests, would in all likelihood have perished in the mutiny or been relegated to a role of little or no influence. These matters can be explained far more simply and without recourse to such speculations. First of all, the Native Americans were not savages when the Nubian Egyptian party arrived. And while one may speak of profound outside influences upon the Olmecs, one should make allowance for the existence of a native civilization, however less advanced, in the Gulf Coast area before the coming of the outsiders. 
to date the coming of the outsiders, therefore in the reign of Ramses III, because it coincides with the very beginnings of Olmec civilization, is quite unnecessary, apart from the fact that the hard carbon datings of the Negroid figures in the Olmec heartland, La Venta, are 800 to 700 BC. Second, the prior existence of a civilization among the Olmecs explains why there is an incorporation of Egyptian elements with native modifications rather than a wholesale replica of Egyptian civilization, although there are a number of identical traits shared by both cultures, reinforcing the evidence of an intimate and prolonged contact. Third, it is dangerous to take so literally, as Jerusalem boy does, the legend of a Ramses third expedition to the, quote, inverted waters, or the, quote, mountain to the far west of the world, believed to be the entrance to the underworld. Couched in this vague mythological language, legends of this nature abound among the sun worshippers of Egypt. Fourth, all the main Ramsey traits traceable to Olmec culture were especially in vogue in the 25th dynasty of the blacks, and some that had lapsed in the Ramses period were revived by the Nubians. Finally, the blacks emerged in America as, quote, tough warrior dynasts, to use Michael Cole's phrase, because that is precisely what they were in the Mediterranean of the same period. 800 to 700 BC. Bearing in mind these reservations, one may still point to a great deal of valuable evidence the Royal Boy presents for an Egyptian contact and influence upon the Olmecs. He notes that Tanis was the place from which Egyptian ships went out on distant expeditions. Tanis is also the place where he cites colossal sculptured heads and stones, some representing Negro Nubians, similar in style and size to the ones found in the Olmec world. This is particularly interesting in view of the fact that the black kings made Tanis their capital, and Taharqa not only concentrated his military and administrative elite in that delta city, but built a new pharaonic palace and gardens there. Jiraza Boy also highlights an oral tradition among the American Indians that may indicate the place where the migrant party from Egypt eventually landed, and the number and type of ships in which they traveled. It appears from this oral tradition, if it relates to the Egyptian flotilla lost off North Africa, that they were blown off course into the North Atlantic current and made their landfall at a place called Panuco, north of Veracruz, in several seven wooden ships or galleys. This oral tradition, recorded in the Popul Vah, the Bible of the Quiche Maya also mentions, quote, black people and pale-skinned people, end quote. As among the people who came to this land from the sunrise, this will fit in with a Nubian Phoenician crew. While oral traditions are sometimes difficult to date, and most literal events in the Popol Vuh go back only 13 generations to about the first decade of the 14th century, some of its recorded traditions do go back to the earliest American civilization, and Jerusalem boy points to a number of datable clues. He demonstrates remarkable similarities between several deities in the Egyptian underworld and those in Olmec, Mexico. At least half a dozen of these gods present in comparative analysis, such a startling identity 
or arbitrary elements in unique combinations that it is difficult to see how independent cultures having no contact or other means of diffusion could duplicate them. These clusters of identical traits go beyond the universal generalities and symbols common to the world's religions. He also draws attention to almost identical ritual practices and funerary customs shared by both cultures, as well as similar names for religious objects and concepts. One or two examples of these rituals may be seen in the phallic cult and the opening of the mouth ceremony. The most striking linguistic identities lie in the names, allowing for slight phonetic and morphemic translations for sun, Mexican and Peruvian Ra from Egyptian Re or Ra for sacred incense, Mexican Copal from Egyptian Kupi for paradise, Peruvian Yaru from Egyptian Aaru for the sacred crocodile Barque Mexican Sipak or Sipakli from the Egyptian Sibak. The Mexicans and Egyptians also share the same hieroglyph for sun, and the origin of heart plucking in Mexico can be traced back to the heart plucking of enemies of the sun god in the Egyptian underworld. I have already noted the similarity between the royal litters and parasols in the two cultures. De Rosa Boy also mentions the double crown of Egypt, which appears on an Olmec dignitary who is proffering an object to a seated Negro figure. Von Wutenau has also noted the pharaonic cap itself on a Nubian figure in Mexico. The Nubian sistrum, a musical instrument, is noted as being in use among the American Indians of Yaqui territory with a similar religious function. The new light De Rosa Boy sheds on the skeletal evidence of the Polish craniologist Wierzynski is of great importance in clearing up confusions over the Atlantic origin of the Negroid population among the Olmecs. He highlights the fact that 13.5% of the skeletons examined in the pre-classic Olmec cemetery of Tlatelolco were Negroid. Yet later at Cerro de las Mesas, in the classic period, only 4.5% were. This indicates that the Negroid element intermarried until it almost fused with the native population. The female found in the graves in the pre-classic period next to the Negroid male is very distinct from the male, native female, foreign male, but becomes similar to the male in the later classic site, indicating progressive intermixture and the growing absorption of the foreign Negroid element into the largely Mongoloid American population. This evidence makes it very clear that the Olmec Negroid element was a distinctive outside element that came, conquered, and crossbred in the Olmec time period rather than proto australoid or proto Negroid Aborigines who may have trickled into America from the Pacific in the very ancient glacial epoch. According to these skeletal statistics, the latter would have disappeared millennia ago into the American gene pool. Therefore, it can only be concluded that Atlantic migrations from the African continent are responsible for the black pre-Columbian presence in America from the Olmecs onward. End of postscripts. End of They Came Before Columbus. The Act.
African presence in ancient America by Ivan Van Zerdema.